In this video, I'm going to illustrate um, an actual problem for a defined benefit pension. So here, uh, I provide you with some information given by the actuary regarding uh, what we need to compute at the end, uh, which is what is our pension expense, okay? So notice that we use this worksheet um, throughout in order to ultimately come up with this journal entry here that we need to record into the accounting system. And basically that journal entry is, is, is indicating what the pension expense is for the period uh, versus also what we pay into those plans and then whether at the end we have a pension asset or pension liability, okay? And a couple other things in there that we'll discuss as we go. Um, Throughout this example, I'm assuming that you already watched the uh, accounting for defined benefit plan pensions video. Uh, that's the one where I go through this whole uh, worksheet uh, in detail. So please watch this video first and then uh, come on over and do this particular problem because I'm going to assume that you uh, know some of this these items already. Okay. Now, let's start off by... Uh, jotting down whatever information they give us. They tell us that the, the uh, projected benefit obligation, in this case, is the liability. This is what the, what the employer, the company, expects to be owe, to be owing in the future or as it stands right now, what that liability is, okay? So they're telling us that the beginning balance in fiscal X6, fiscal year X6, X6 is going to be 3 million, Six hundred fifty thousand. So I'm going to input that information here, and just for reference, let me use the same color. They also tell us that the beginning balance of the plan asset itself, the worth, the fair market value of it, is two point nine million. So I'm going to come over here and enter that information. Now, a quick reminder: this. Here, you don't necessarily record it in the books directly, but you do that record it indirectly. So in other words, from if you watch the original video on accounting for defined benefit plans, you know that only these items right here are the ones we're going to eventually use for the journal entry, right? And then these right here are just on the side that we need to track to you know in order to know how to enter all these things. Or, you know, how do I not so much that, but in order to keep track of all the things that are going on in here, we're always indicating how that affects the liability, the, uh, the projected benefit obligation, and also the plan asset itself. This right here is your projected liability, what you're going to owe of that pension. And this here is the actual worth of that plan, right? So some financial institution is going to administer this plan, invest the monies, and uh, at the same time, we have a projection of what it should have. So in this case, notice how the liability starting out is 3.6 million, roughly. And what the plan is worth is 2.9 million. So here, when we start out, we technically have a liability, right? Because we owe more than what it's worth. So I'll start out over here and say, okay, this is my liability. Oops, did not work out. Okay, there we go. For some reason, it was working. But the idea is this. Our, the value of our plan assets is $2.9 million, but we're projected to owe $3.7 million, roughly. So right now, we are in a pension liability. Okay, so it's a liability situation. And you can put a negative here if you'd like to indicate that it's a credit, but, you know, I'm going to understand that it's a liability as I go forward. And at the end of the period, this is the information we're going to use for... 4 million, let me get this out of the way here, um, 4 million 195 is this ending balance, and then the plan assets they tell us is 3 million 790,000. Okay, so those are these two items here. similar of a color as I can so that we use it as reference. Okay. 
so there we go. So at, at the beginning, what I'm saying is that we started off in a liability scenario where the pension technically is underfunded, right? Because we owe more than what the plan is worth. And then at the end of the period, let's see where we stand. Same scenario. This is the liability and this is what it's worth, right? So at the end of the period, we have a liability of $405,000, which is the difference between $4.2 million and $3.8 million, right? So this is real important because whatever amount we need to make this column balance, in other words, to go from a $750,000 liability to a 405,000 liability, that's the amount that eventually needs to be put into the journal entry right here. Okay, that difference. So another way to look at it is I do this T account right here. Look at the pension asset liability. It started out with 750,000 from above and it ended with 405,000. So throughout the period, we're gonna need to figure out how much this is through all the work that we do internally in this worksheet. So now, you know, you can do it right now as a plug and that's fine. The plug, you know, would be 345,000. We need a debit of 345,000. I should have, I should have uh, colored this in here with gray. So, it, you know, it depends what you need, right? If you, if the liability is going down, then I'm gonna have to debit this. So the liability here goes down by 345,000. And technically I could go in here and say, okay, this is what this needs to come out to be. So in other words, in the journal entry, I can already know that this is a, a debit of $345,000. And that's fine. And you can use that information to make sure that at the end, this ends up being $345,000. Okay? And we'll figure that out as we go. But at least you understand that this right here, explaining this ending balance is part of the goal of what you're doing here. And I think that helps you. Okay. Um, so the next thing we're told is the accumulated OCI general ledger amount, I'm sorry, not general ledger, gain or loss amount is 198,000. So at the beginning of the period, the OCI stuff related to the gains of losses started with $198,000 and it ended with a negative 24, in other words, a gain. So I'm going to go in here. And I'm going to say that this should end at negative $24,000. So in other words, all the things that occur within this column are going to get us from 198 to a, a loss of 198 to a gain of negative or a gain of $24,000. So mathematically, we got to make that work. Okay. So here's the next thing. Or did I, did I, is it a gain or a loss? Bear with me one second. Yes, that's correct. So if, if we're here, if I'm putting it as a positive, uh, that's a loss. And then if it get, it's a negative, it's indicating a credit. Uh, but, you know, however you do the, the positives or negatives, that's your choice. It's just understanding that you got to go from a loss position to a gain position here. Okay. Now, in the video on how to account for uh, defined benefit pensions, one of the things that I talk about that seems a little tricky is this corridor test that we have to do at the beginning of the period. Okay, and that's what I'm going to illustrate right here, the corridor test. And the corridor test says um, you get 10% of the larger of PBO or plan assets. Okay, and that's your uh, amount that you're testing at the corridor. So if I look at the, both of these values, right, right here, the beginning values. And I go in there and say, okay, which one's the larger of the two? Okay, so it's this one's the larger. So now get 10% of that. Okay, 10% of 3650000 is $365,000, right? So that becomes my corridor on the upper and lower threshold. Now, how do we use this information? Well, you, grab, you look at this number right here and say, okay, gains and losses of 198000 In this case, we're calling these losses, okay? Losses of $198,000, are they outside of this corridor? And they're not, right? Because we came up with this corridor to decide whether this gain beginning balance is too large. 
And if it's too large, then we start amortizing it. Okay, so make sure you watch the video on how I explain that so that you understand what I'm talking about. So since 198 falls somewhere around here between those three, the 365 corridor, then I would say that we have no amortization to do. All right. But if for some reason, you know, so the amortization would be done over here. That would be this H. So if you had some amount that needed to be amortized, you would take the difference and then you would divide it by the average service life for each employee. So in other words, let me just throw out an example so that you can see better. So for amortization purposes of the prior service cost, I'm indicating that the average service life is 10 and a half years. So let's assume that this number were $400,000 beginning balance. So when you do your corridor test, you notice that 400,000 is outside of the corridor, right? So once it's outside, and that's what this means, if this beginning balance is larger than the ZZ corridor, this is the amount I came up with the ZZ, 365 positive and 365 negative. So that range of numbers. So if my beginning balance is larger than ZZ, then I'm outside of the corridor. And if I'm outside of the corridor, then I have to amortize some of this. I would have to amortize the difference. So hold on, bear with me here. So what that means is I would have to amortize $35,000, but not all of it at once, over the average service life of the employees. So in other words, I would take this amount that is outside of the corridor, and I would come over here, and I would, since we have a, 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 in this case, it's a loss, we have a debit position, we would credit it out. So we would go in here and we would credit 35 divided by 10 and a half. Okay, so notice what this formula says. This formula says, take the OCI gain and loss amount at the beginning of the period, which is in my second example here is 400,000. Take the corridor amount, which in my example is 365. So that gives you $35,000. $35, and that $35,000 value X, you're going to divide it by the average service life. So whatever 35 divided by 10 and a half is, you would then amortize here and here. And ultimately, that increases your pension expense as a debit to pension expense. Okay, and I know that seems weird, uh, perhaps. But the idea is this, very simple. This OCI column for gains and losses is a place where we put things like unexpected gains and losses based on the returns of the portfolio. Uh, we also put unexpected gains and losses from actuarial changes. And sometimes these things reverse out over time. So sometimes you have gains, sometimes you have losses. And the idea is this should normally not get so large, right? And if it doesn't, that's fine. Then we just kind of carry it forward as things reverse out. But if it starts getting too large, like in the case of the example 400,000, then we say, well, at that point, then we need, to, we need to take some of it out slowly until we get rid of the whole 35 or until things reverse over time. So we'll do this test every period, right? And every period is going to be a different result. All right, so that's how you would use it. But we are told we have 198. So we're going to go in here and put 198. And we have determined that it's within the corridor. Let me get rid of this. We've determined that it's within the corridor, so we don't have to do any amortization of it. We're fine as is. All right, the other thing we're told is that the beginning balance of OCI prior service cost is 1140000 And there's some information here about the the amortization of that OCI, which I'll get to in a minute. And we're told that the ending balance is 1,020,000. All right, let me go over here, put this 1,000,000 for prior service cost. That's the ending balance. So some something must have been done throughout the period that reduced that value. And that, that which is done is you amortize some of it, right? Remember, this is related to negotiations that are done with your employees, the employer and the employee, on granting additional benefits for pensions. So the way we do it is we put it into OCI and then slowly, slowly, we get rid of it through amortization right here. 
So what I'm saying is if there's a value here in the past, this was done where we added that to OCI and we said, okay, now we owe more, but we didn't hit the pension expense directly for the full amount. We do that little by little every period. So this period, we're going to do a little bit as well. All right, since we're talking about it, let's address it. So the original bounds for that prior service cost is 1 million to 60. So somewhere in the past, this was negotiated as such. And then the average service life of the employees is 10 and a half. So the amortization that needs to be done per period is $120,000. So in other words, here, when we do this, we're gonna do minus 120,000 and we're gonna debit or more expense of 120,000. Okay, so by doing that, we're slowly getting that prior service cost to expense because we're not gonna do it over one period alone. We're gonna slowly get it to the pension expense amount. So that explains fully this column, if you notice, because now it balances out. We don't have to do anything else to this column. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Uh, we are told that the interest rate is 8%. Okay, so that, what that means is you're going to go in here, and for this period, we're going to record 8% uh, interest based on the liability. So you can think of the interest as, as, uh, as a loan. Think of, that. think of this liability here as a regular loan. And in a sense, it's not that much different. This is, this is an amount that we will owe our employees, right? So whenever you have a debt, it accrues interest. So this interest is going to be 8% of the beginning balance of the liability. So this will be 365, I'm sorry, 3,650,000 times 8%. And that comes out to be $292,000. So we'll record that. So when I come over here, I'm going to put in 292000 as more pension expense, and that's going to increase my liability of the PBO, 292000 Now, notice how even though I'm recording this as more pension expense, I'm doing a credit over here to PBO or more liability for PBO, but technically I'm not recording this in my books, okay? And this, this is the part that's kind of confusing sometimes. This is for me to just track what's going on. The ultimate net effect of all these things that I'm recording on this side, let me highlight them all. The ultimate net effect of all these things that I just highlighted, those will be reflected in one amount right here. Keep that in mind, okay? And that one amount is the amount that will actually get us to this 405 that we discussed uh, not 405, the 345 that we discussed initially that we need as a debit. Okay, but we'll let that play out. Let's, let's go see the whole thing. It could serve as a, as a goal for you to check your work. All right, so that's the 8%. We did that. Then they tell us that the actual return on the investment, okay? So, okay, so this is a good point to illustrate here. The interest rate belongs to the PBO, right? The actual return belongs to the actual plan, right? The plan asset itself. So if you have to compute interest, it's based on the PBO. If you have to compute the return, it's based on the actual investments themselves. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to say, well, they're saying that the actual return is 10%. So that's 2.9 million. That's the beginning balance here. Time 10, time 10, time 10 sorry is $290,000, and that is a gain during the period. So notice how a gain is reflected as a credit, and don't let that trick you. That's just saying, look, if you're dealing with the account pension expense, a credit is a minus, right, because you have less expense. So I'm gonna go in here, and I am going to get $290,000, because this is a gain. This reduces my expenses, and then here, this increases the plan asset itself. So I'm going to reflect that right here. Okay. Don't get confused with the pluses and minuses. This is, you know, every time you're analyzing this, you say, okay, well, how is this column affected? Well, if I have a positive return, if things are going well for me during a particular period, 
then what that means is that I have less expense to record that period because the market itself, by increasing in value, the market itself is, or the portfolio, let's be more specific, the portfolio itself by increasing in value is helping me meet that obligation. So I have less expense. And then the opposite is true, right? If for some reason during the period you had a loss, then this would be positive. And then this would be negative because you would be reducing the value of the actual plan assets. Okay, this debit and credit stuff can sometimes get confusing within here, but just think big picture, think the column itself. What's going on with the column? Pension expense is going down. All right, so that's reflected. Then they also say that the expected return is 10%. So that makes it very easy because then what we're saying is that the actual return on the portfolio is exactly the expected return. And why is that important? Okay, well, here, we have a scenario in F1 and F2 that says, jot down the expected amount right here. But if for some reason the, ex I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Jot down the actual return here. But if for some reason the expected amount is different than 290, then you need to remove some of that out of there. And the idea is simple. I know it seems complicated, but it's very simple. The market, you know, the value of, plan assets is based on a portfolio of investments, right? That value fluctuates. That value goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down. It's constantly changing, right? So if in one period we have a very high return, let's say that this, you know, they told us that this is the expectation, but let's just say that this was very high. If this is very high, then we go in and we say, well, don't reflect the full amount. Let's say that the expectation, just to, just for conversation here, the expected amount was 200,000. In other words, a, a more realistic expectations of returns on average was 200,000. Well, if that's the case, then 90 is the unexpected amount, right? You would go in there and say, it says here, take your expected return. I'm sorry, take your actual return and subtract expected return. So that's 290 is the actual, 200 would be the expected. And then you take uh, you take the the uh, the amount in excess and you jot it in here. All right. So how do we account for it? Well, if let's say that ninety thousand of it is unexpected, right? If this if the two ninety is reducing our expense and we're trying to take out ninety out of there, right? Then we would go in here and say, okay, no, 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 put that expense back as ninety over here, and Put it as a credit over here of 90. Now bear with me. So this re this ultimately is increasing the expense of for the period because what we're saying is that return was just too high. It could be a, a very high fluctuation. Let's just ease that, smooth that. It's more the correct term. Now what ends up happening is all these unexpected amounts start accumulating right here, right? And there will be one period where it's a gain. There might be a period where it's a loss, etc. And like I said initially, this eventually kind of balances out. If the market's going up, that would be this. If the market's going down, that would be a loss. And what we end up doing is we end up smoothing pension expense so that we don't reflect fully those very big fluctuations. Now, if the market is trending up, 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 and it's always getting more gains, more gains, then that's when this starts getting too big. And that's when the, the result would be outside of the corridor test. So that's when we go in there and say, okay, well, it's not, apparently it's not a temporary thing because things are getting very large outside of the corridor. So let's start amortizing back some of it. All right, so that's kind of the flow there. So let me undo this. And perhaps let me, let me put it a different way here. As these unexpected things are, are, are you know, arise, then we put them in here, right? And over time, they should level out. If they don't level out, if they start trending up or trending down and, and this balance, OCI gains and losses gets too big, then at the beginning of the period, we're gonna test it. And if it's outside of the corridor, we're gonna start slowly bringing it back to pension expense. So it's almost like it does this full circle. Like it goes from here to eventually, based on a corridor test, come back over here. So we take it out, the unexpected amount, it starts getting too large, then we start bringing it back to pension expense. But 
here's the thing, folks. We take out the whole 90,000, let's say, okay? And then we start bringing in little by little some of those amounts if they are outside of the corridor. So again, this process here of going like this to, to get rid of that gain or that loss, that unexpected, unexpected gain or loss, it's a smoothing process. It's not fast. And the reason it's not fast, and I, I hope you've picked up on this, is because of the fluctuations in the market. We don't want to reflect those changes immediately because things could just reverse the next period. And why record a humongous gain this period when next period we're going to record a humongous loss? It makes no sense. So what we do is we go and slowly start going in there or backwards, right? If it's unexpected amounts. All right, hopefully that part is clear. It's a little confusing sometimes for students. Um, contributions are $600,000. So this is the amount that the company pays to the plan. So this is a credit to cash, right? So I, since I'm dealing with cash, I know that this is going to be minus cash. And if you want to put a minus in there, it, might, you know, it can help you. Um, and then this is going to be going, those 600000 are going to go straight to the plan asset. So that's more on the plan asset. Finally, we have service costs. This, these are the expenses incurred during the period. So that's what goes right here. So we have more expense, 475. This is what the employees earn during the period. And then what they earn, we owe it, right? So that's how the liability goes up. And it might be worthwhile to mention a couple things here because this goes back to accrual accounting. So notice these two things. This here is the expense incurred for the period for the services that they provided and that employees earned as a pension benefit. That's my expense incurred. And as the accrual accounting, the accrual basis works, we don't always recognize the expense for the cash we pay, right? And this is the case right here as well. So even though we are recognizing an expense for service cost of 475 incurred, expense incurred, our cash outflow is $600,000. And we reflect that on the actual investment plan and this goes for the liability. Now, it's a little bit more complicated here with pensions because you have an interest, you have the return you have to deal with that affects pension expense. You also have amortization of prior service costs that affects pension expense. But nevertheless, understand that this is the expense, pension expense incurred for the period. Uh, and this is what we're paying out. If the plan starts going up in value, naturally, because the market is reacting positively, uh, then our contributions might actually be less sometimes. But in this case, since we are underfunded, both at the beginning of the period and at the end of the period, you notice we're underfunded because the liability is higher than what the plan is worth, we are probably going to be making more contributions than the actual service cost. And that's even the case after we had some gains here, right, of $290,000. Okay. Um, this is just a lot of moving parts with the, this type of exercise, a lot of moving parts. But let's go ahead and see what we have. So um, they didn't tell us anything about benefits being paid to retirees, so we will not have to deal with this. But keep in mind that if benefits are paid, in other words, retired employees start collecting on their pension, that doesn't affect us. Notice how there's nothing affecting our journal entries. That is dealt directly with the financial institution and then the actuary that is record or keeping track of that liability by informing us that the cash went out from the plan asset. So that's something we no longer owe. The liability goes down with the debit. Okay. But we don't have to do anything here. So that's nice. So let me just black this out so we don't even have to think about it. All right. Next thing. Uh, did we grant any prior service costs in the past? No, that was previously done, so we don't even have to deal with this. Perhaps uh, that makes it easier to just look at it like that, right? Um, the other thing is, did we have any unexpe unexpected gains and losses? And we talked about it, and we said no, so hey, nothing to deal with this. Actually, let me include this because there was no loss. It was all gain. So we don't have to mess with that either. Uh, did we have any information from the actuary regarding unexpected changes or unexpected gains and losses? So we did not, right? So there's nothing related to that here. No, but it might be worth talking about it just a little bit. What is this? 
Okay, so these this right here reflects the unexpected gains and losses from the return of the market, right? So if, like I said, if this 290 is more than what we expected, then some of it is taken out. Here, this is something different. This is this is, these are changes that result from non-market related items. So for example, the actuary might the life expectancy of of the pensioners might have changed for some reason. So if you think of uh, maybe a pandemic that occurs or something, life expectancies all of a sudden go down, and that can re that can result in an unexpected gain for the company because if your pensioners pass, then you no longer have to pay uh, the benefits, right? So unexpectedly, something might occur that you the actuary says, well. Even though we projected the liability be, to be something, it actually ended up being less liability. And that's why this is a debit. Uh, or the opposite could be true, right? Something might have happened that made us owe more money. Maybe a new regulation out there all of a sudden came out uh, that requires us to pay more and it was unexpected. So those kind of things, we throw them into OCI. We don't put them directly into pension expense. And as I mentioned early, earlier, they go into OCI, but then eventually, they are outside of the corridor, then they are amortized into pension expense slowly. Okay, but we don't have any of that. They didn't tell us anything related to these things. And on top of that, we don't have any amortization of uh, gains and losses from OCI because our amount was within the corridor. So all this gone. So that's all we have. Okay, so what do we need to do here? We need to do the math. The math basically from column A, from netting all these things, gives me 597, 597,000. The amounts of cash that went out was just that one payment that was 600,000, so that's minus 600. And again, I, I shouldn't have even put the, the minus 600, but let's go ahead and do it. It's, it's, it's up to you to put the minus 600 or not, um, because ultimately, the, okay, so let's 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 say one more thing. Ultimately, you don't need this worksheet. Okay, this is just to organize your thoughts. This is my way of organizing the thoughts. There could be different ways of doing it, right? So, how you put the pluses and minuses, that's up to you. Now, I understand that cash is going out, so I'm going to simply go in here and say, okay, this is a credit to cash for six hundred thousand, and I put it in as a negative because I know I'm paying contributions to the plan, right? Um, and then finally, it says here, OCI prior service costs and OCI gains and losses are not the bounds. It's not this amount, but instead the amounts within. So you got to go in here and say, let's go to prior service costs. So within prior service costs, we know we had an amortization of 120000 coming out. Right? So this here is going to be reflected as a credit coming out of this prior service cost. Because this is, think of this as some big expense that's being held right there and then as you take out the expense you credit it and you debit the pension expense so i'm going to go in here and this is going to be let me clean this up a little bit so this ends up being a credit of 120,000. all right and then the OCI gains and losses, let's go ahead and look at that. So we started with 198,000 and um, we are, oh, and then we end up with negative 24,000. So actually I made a mistake here because even though the problem doesn't tell us, let me, let me remove this here. Um, even though the problem doesn't tell us Let's see if I can find the same blue. I'm able to do that. Nope. I don't think it's that important, but there we go. So, so let me repeat that. Even though the problem did not specifically tell us, there must be some unexpected gain or loss due to the actuary. And the reason I say that is because we did the corridor test, and this does not apply, right? We didn't have to do amortization based on the corridor test. So clearly this did not happen. All right, so let's, let's block that out. Because we did the test at the beginning of the period and uh, just
just to reiterate, 198 was not outside of this corridor, so no amortization is done. So there is no amortization to do here. But how are we going to go from 198,000 beginning balance to negative 24,000? And the only way that that can happen, the only way that that can happen is if for some reason we're being told that um, a gain, an unexpected actuarial change, actuarial gain or loss occurred to make this balance. And I know it's not it's not evident, you know, it's not clear that that's what happened, but it's, I'm doing it by a process of elimination, okay? I know we don't have this, and I know we don't have this. So because of that, the only l remaining item is this. And for us, to, for us to go from a 198 loss at the beginning of the period to a $24,000 gain, then somewhere along the way, we made a credit here for $222,000, okay? And this is over here, it's gonna be a reduction to the liability, right? If you have a gain. So a few minutes ago, I don't know if you recall, but I said, this could be something like a change in life expectancy of your, of your retirees. So if some of your retirees uh, pass earlier than you thought, then that liability goes down. You no longer owe those pension benefits payments. So that could be one of those scenarios where that unexpected gain ends up um, ends up reducing our liability. Okay, so the only way that this would work is if that occurred. Now in real life, just to be uh, clear, in real life, you would know this information, you would be told directly. So the fact that, you know, it's not indicated in here, um, it can seem like a little tricky, okay? But just understand that it, it could have been so easy to just put it, you know, have a, an information item here that says unexpected gains of 222,000 uh, provided by the actuary, okay? So what that means is this is the journal, and this goes into the journal entry right here for OCI gains and losses. And this will be a credit of $222,000. Okay? Now, when you do this, oh, I got to put the pension expense. When you do this and you do 597 here, the summation of A, the summation or the netting of A, you should be able to work this out and it should work out to $345,000. Okay, so if these numbers right here, the netting of this number, these numbers work out to 345, then that right there is the plug amount that you needed, that we knew we needed. Um, to be able to get to uh, 405. Now, this is where the negatives and the positives can be tricky, right? Since this was a liability, yeah, to be more consistent, I should have started saying by, okay, this is a negative 750 liability, just so it reflects on the credit side. Um, because, and th th it's tricky with this one because this, this account right here can be an asset or a liability, right? So to be more clear, I'm just gonna say credit. That would be the best way. So this is a credit of 750, so it's a liability, and it ended up with a credit of 405. And in part, that's why I did this T account right here, so you can visualize it. So the only way I can get that to work is by putting a debit here of 345, and that's what we did right here. Okay. So I know this math works out. So there you go. You it, once this works out for you, you do the math right here, and it works out to 345 then you fully checked your work because you knew you needed to get 345 and then the actual workings of it gave you 345. And there you go. So that worked out real nice, right? So for the period, the pension expense is roughly close to what you're paying. Notice that your, your pension expense incurred is 597,000 and what you actually pay to the plan is 600. Now all these other workings in between, uh, you know, that's just what we did up there. So to conclude here, this plan is still underfunded, right? But at least it's underfunded by less than what it started out to be. Uh, sometimes these, by the way, sometimes these actuarial gains and losses, these unexpected ones, I mentioned earlier, could be due to regulations. So if for some reason regulations force companies to not be so underfunded, you know, maybe there's a change to those rules, then you would, you know, you would have to fund this stuff and those could be or, or, or maybe some changes related to um, how much the liability needs to be versus whatever. 
Okay, any any type of regulatory change like that, that could affect how much we owe, that would be reflected as an unexpected thing here. But that's given to us by the actuary. Okay, so big problem, a lot of things going on here. Watch it as many times as you want so you can truly understand this. But um, uh, after you put all this information in here and you use this pension worksheet, and you, already, you use this pension worksheet, if it works for you, if it doesn't, that's fine. There's some people that, instead of having this worksheet, they just understand what affects pension expense positively or negatively, right? Um, so in other words, if we have service costs and interest, those are positive expense and expense things. If we have to amortize prior service costs, that's more expense, right? Um, if we have unexpected gains, unexpected gains, then they know that that reduces the pension expense for the period and things like that. But at least the worksheet helps you organize this information. N to reiterate, none of these things that we have written down right here. Oh, this is supposed to be a zero. That's why the formula didn't work. Okay. None of these items that we have right here are directly in our books. Okay, I, I want to make that very clear. This is this is just for us to kind of track indirectly what this is in our books. So even though I don't have this information in our books, I have the information of whether I'm funded or underfunded. And at the end of the period, all this stuff that we did here, not reflected directly in our books, but direct, reflected indirectly in our books with a pension liability of 405 at the end of the period. All right, this concludes the video on uh, an example, an actual working out a problem for the defined benefit plan.